Well, today we're very fortunate to have with us Ed Frega, who happened to be this year's uh, juror for the West Michigan Area Show. And Ed is a Detroit area artist who over the past 40 years has really created a remarkable body of work that uh, while it has changed and evolved in many ways, has always remained focused on what the artist uh, describes as the intent to unveil the unseen. And this idea of unveiling the unseen, I think, goes back perhaps to uh, Ed's childhood, where he was fascinated with the concept of magic, reading about magic, performing magic, and then later made the connection uh, to art, which I think is quite interesting, where he says that the trick in both magic and art is to create an illusion by drawing the viewer into your world and suspend their disbelief, if only for a while. The desire is that visual experience will resonate for some time after. And I think along with the idea of magic, you'll find in his work is very much concerned with transformation in um, many, many different ways. Uh, you'll kind of discover that um, familiar materials, in some cases discarded materials, appear in a new context and kind of take on a different meaning. And as the different objects that we may be very familiar with, but now see in a different context that opens up all sorts of other associations. So this idea of transformation, uh, art, uh, so ties into, as you'll see, uh, alchemy and spirituality and really makes for incredibly rich uh, subject matter and uh, particular ways which Ed has explored it. So please welcome uh, Ed Fragan. Thank you, Greg. I was talking to Greg before, and he was saying how he retired and had worked 40 years here. Pretty close. Wow, that's great to have been here for that one. And thank you very much for that introduction. And it's uh, great to be here. I feel like the KIA is kind of my second home because I've shown here a couple times back in 1994 when I was like 18, no, I'm just lying. And then 2004, I was in a group show. Um, and the museum owns a work. They actually purchased a work. The former director, Jim Bridenstine, uh, I kind of forced him to buy a work before he retired. So there's a drawing that I'll show you. That's um, some of the early work. And um, I've gotten to know uh, Rahima Barber, who's here the chief curator of the KIA, and uh, uh, we, I, I helped with an uh, artist's estate a few years ago and got to know her, and uh, she came to see a show I had this past fall and um, really enjoyed working with her and her insights and her vision. We are very fortunate to have her. And, and then working on the Western West uh, Michigan Art Show was really a lot of fun, and Catherine Ransbottom. And so it's a really good show you have to see opens Friday. And uh, anyway, so I'm going to show a few works. There's about 80. And uh, I'll start by, you know, showing and starting with, I think I get this right. So um, I started off doing drawings. I went to Wayne State University, got my Bachelor of Fine Arts in 1980. And uh, when I was going to college, I lived with my grandfather. And um, this is a drawing of him. Um, it took me several months to do. It's very small and very meticulous. My grandfather lived to be 91. Uh, he and his wife, who's the portrait above, she died a few years before I did this drawing, uh, immigrated from uh, Mexico in 1918, crossed the Rio Grande with two kids, and eventually found his way up to Michigan, where he became a dairy farmer. And my other uh, paternal, maternal grandparents were also dairy farmers. So I feel humbled by the fact that I am just the grandson of farmers and I chose to be an artist. And um, I do a lot of work that you'll see throughout having to do with my personal relationships with family and the closeness that I believe in. 
So uh, these are just some early drawings when I was in um, college. These are very large self-portraits, um, life-size detail. Another color pencil. And then this is the drawing that's in the KIA. And it took me about six months to do. It took me 40 grass greens to do the green background. I kept track of how many it took. And um, yeah, this is a kind of culmination of all the drawings I, I did at the time. And it was kind of a, became a, almost like a painting, unlike a drawing where every area was completely covered. This is another drawing, early drawing. And then I put this in because it's probably about eight years later, I was doing works where the figures were a little more distorted. Um, they weren't based on any real observation, but had more of a kind of a dream um, fantasy. And they were all about the idea of man sinking into water. They're called the sinking man, floating man. And... Um, this is a drawing for this painting. And these are very large. They're, I think, something like eight feet by five feet. This is Floating Man. And I wanted all of them where the figures were submerged in water and their hands were all covered. Not because I can't paint hands, but I wanted them vulnerable to the environment and to the nature. And it got my interest in the idea of the natural elements surrounding the figure. This is just a detail. And then I would, I would do these formed natural element uh, structures that were, this is a construction made from a, a, a crate that I had used to ship a painting. So it's a found object that I took and reconstructed and part of the idea, the idea of portals is that a lot of the times I'm working with early in the work, that I, my early work, I, I, I take objects or found objects or doors and I've reconstructed them with paintings suspended or somehow built within the structure. These are some altars I did based on the four seasons. This is called Summer. They're also quite large. They're from pedestal, from floor to the top, it's about five feet. This is the, the drawing for the painting. This is fall, spring, and this is winter. And then this uh, is a piece that came right around the same time uh, as the winter painting. And I had a, a, a friend model for me. So I, I worked from photographs and, and, and I was really interested in these, like I said, portals, these, these almost like eye shaped forms, which become these vistas by which you look through and um, kind of based on old Victorian framed windows. And this is a portrait I did of a friend and his wife using all kinds of materials, wax. And here's another example of a found frame I found in the alley in the city, in the Detroit area that I lived in at the time. And actually a friend bought the small painting that's set inside and she later asked if I would build a frame for it. So this um, became the piece. Here's another landscape in which the I tried to do these works that had the sense of uh, other light otherworldly light inside the the painting as if they're glowing um, and this is a portrait actually um, around this time my mother had a brain aneurysm and uh, it was a strange experience to see your mother um, with a shaved head. And so uh, it took her months to recover from surgery. And after that, I did a series of heads that were of these uh, otherworldly faces 
the, the blue suggests sort of death or transitioning to another existence. This is a, a painting for an installation I did, um, Blue Angel, for an installation I showed at uh, Cranbrook Art Museum. I don't have photos of the installation, but. And this is uh, an installation uh, or a photo of uh, an ins uh, or a painting that I had in a show called Interventions at the Detroit Institute of Arts in 1994. And I was asked along with 40 artists to submit work to put in the museum in the context of other galleries. And I chose the early Northern European painting gallery. And my painting is the one with the, the sheets. And the museum purchased my work from that show. This is the work. It's called uh, La Santa y Gloriosa Carne, which uh, translates holy and glorious flesh. And at this time, uh, it was around 1992, I was doing paintings dealing with um, bed sheets. And a lot of the work alluded to um, the plague of the time, which was AIDS. And so in here, you have this bed as if the sheets are being unfolded and the figures have left. And you have cow lily suggesting uh, the loss. And there's just a closer detail. And then this is the inner landscape. The painting is actually three-dimensional. The, the sheets um, are, are, were painted. Um, I had set up in my studio the folds of the sheet, and then I painted them. And then the, the golden landscape is actually a three-dimensional window. So it's actually sticking um, within the painting. It's, it's hard to see in this, but... Um, and this is part of the installation uh, that I mentioned at Cranbrook. This was a uh, part of the wings that went inside of the room. And I, I put this in relationship to a newer work. This is, um, I'm kind of jumping, and then I'll go back to some early work in a minute, but this is um, a work that I just recently showed at a gallery in Detroit called Wasserman Projects. And these, this was uh, one of, this is how it was viewed in the gallery. This is a huge monolith that I had constructed. First time I had a work fabricated where I had a, army of people build for me and it's a nine foot by five foot um uh, wood structure and then i gold leafed it in the gallery it took me about a week and this is the the show that it was in here are the two pieces there is a black and a gold monolith um this is how it looks in the studio and here's the black monolith in the gallery the show was called Ocean Body, and the gallery director, Allison Wong, curated the show. And I was one of six artists. You can see in the back, there is a film that that's taking part, um, taking place. And then this artist in the front, the plaster pieces, her name is uh, um, Lily Cox Richard. She's an artist from um, the East Coast. She builds these plaster pieces. But what's really beautiful about the, the piece is the reflective quality. I had these pieces built, um, they're called hymns. Let's see if I have another picture. The black one is called Hymn of the Seraphim and the gold is called Hymn of the Cherubim. And they really represent um, what we're going through right now. I mean, I wanted these structures built so that as you walk up to the black monolith, you can see a reflection. It becomes almost like a mirror. And um, the gold represents something beyond our physical body. It represents something eternal. And, you know, given that we're still in this pandemic, I wanted this to represent, in a sense, the death that we're faced with, the lives that have been lost, but also um, the hope in better days. This is how the one looks in my studio. These are the two of them together. And they're quite heavy. It, it, it's a production just to get them installed. It, you have to have a hoist. It took seven hours to get them from the gallery to my studio. And there's a plate that goes into the floor. Each weighs about 300 pounds. And um, 
you can't touch the surface too. So there's a top portion that you can use the hoist to lift them up. But it's, um, it was a really interesting project that really tested my uh, stretching myself as an artist and doing something outside of my comfort zone. But it was really rewarding. This is an installation view in my studio of the gold piece. And then there's some earlier works uh, in the studio. This is one of them. It's called Reliquary. And I did this piece after the death of my mother uh, about 12 years ago. And she kept a diary after the death of my father. And in it, she had three sentences that she wrote over and over again for two years. She had several books. There were probably about 10. But after her death, I decided to do this work. And I built this, this structure and suspended her diary inside of this um, window. And I uh, made sure that the words were kept private. I, I have a detail of the flowers, which is a separate, the second, you can see the second view. But in, 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 in the back of the piece, you can see the structure that houses the diary. It's this uh, ziggurat. And it's uh, the, the diary sets way in, and there's a plexiglass in front of it. So when you go up to it, you can't read the words. You can try to make it up, but you can't. And then the curtain, it's, this is something you can view as you walk behind it. And there's, uh, my father was an electrician, so the light represents him. And then it's called um, Reliquary, but it also has another title called The Curtain Holds Their Secrets and Memories. This is another work I did around the same time. This is a found piece of wood. And it's also uh, a reference to both my parents. And this, in this work, there are two guitar strings that are suspended in the panel that has uh, two dowels holding it. It's called Lovers. And this is an installation that I did where you can see the back of the panel. And uh, the show, which had the reliquary, was in a gallery in Ferndale in 2012. The show was called Love Duet. And so I took a guitar and I broke it up into pieces, dismantled it. And um, inside that uh, sort of uh, scaffold, there's a, a pearl that's being lowered inside of the center part of the, the guitar. And I cut the arm off and it's on part of the wall covered in pearls as well. This is just another work around the same time called Healing Wound, a painting on panel. And this is a portrait based on my mother. And these are some drawings that I did that were also in the show. I really like sometimes the immediacy of just drawing and sometimes some of the most interesting things come through. And this is a reference to the cradle, but also the lantern. It's like from cradle to grave. So here's one drawing. And it, they're very quickly done. Like it probably took me a few hours to do this. Here's the lantern. These are studies for the guitar. But sometimes I find artist drawings to be in some ways more interesting than finished works. They have a real immediacy. This is another um, work that I did. This is a, a still from a, a movie from 1969 of my mother and, and my sister. And I took the still and printed it on acetate. This is her uh, lampshade that was in her bedroom. And as I said, my, my parents are both the children of dairy farmers. And so I took a collage of the, of the cows, put them inside of the lampshade, and then I put the translucent um, still from the uh, from the movie and suspended it, so you can see through the the the, the uh, image. So when you stand in front of it, it's 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 a, it's a work that is on the wall. So when you stand in front of it, you can actually see through and you can see the cows through it. And these are pillows that belong to my parents. Um, this is called clouds. So I just basically took four pillows and tied them up. And um, one of my, two of my favorite artists, one is Marcel Duchamp. And uh, part of it is because of what he did by putting a urinal in a gallery. 
to me, it was one of the most revolutionary things in art history because it changed the direction and the, what, what art would be, what, what you would consider art to be. And he made what's called ready-mades, which are everyday objects that are kind of transformed so that you look at them differently. And uh, that's, this is a really simple thing. I just took four pillows and tied them, but there's something simple about it. And a lot of times I will meander between painting and objects because I find there's this interesting um, language that objects have that paintings tend not to. This is a photo I, uh, of my father and his future brother-in-law. My father was probably 19 at the time. Th these are more recent works. And in this one, um, I took the photo and then I removed my, my, my uncle. And the funny part of this too is they're both holding Wonder Bread. This is like from 19, I, don't, I wasn't even born. And my father with his pants and tie, they were kind of joking, I guess, when they took this. But so I did a diptych, then I removed my father. And then I did a series of drawings. In, in a sense, I, I think the reason I did this, it's sort of the beatification of my father. I was like transforming him from just being a, a human. And then that's why I have these references to Jesus and these higher uh, saint-like figures. And then I wrote um, over uh, one of the figures, there's, I think, Jesus. And it has to do with a tree. And this tree that's in the background is a tree that I had this experience when I was a child at the farm where this was taken of my grandparents. And it was a kind of epiphany where I felt like I was the last person on earth. I was probably eight at the time. And I just felt like I was the only person on earth. I can't explain it other than my parents and my brothers and sisters were in the house and I was walking down the end of the drive and I had this amazing experience. I think we all had things like that happen in our life where they're like out of body experiences. And I think in some ways it was a transformative um, experience that made me want to be an artist. And here uh, where my uncle was, it's now the figures turned into this blue like figure and then my father's turned blue. And then here it is the complete well, let me go back. Um, I, I placed gold over it, so he's now he's now gone, and 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 what remains is this um, this gold remnant. Here's an image of a tree again, alluding to the tree that I had this experience. And then part of uh, and these are some works that sort of going back now, dealing with innocence, childhood. Uh, these are probably from like 2000, again, using gold, my interest in gold leaf, but more fantasy driven as were these, these are oil crayons here as well. And this is a book, or this is an installation of a piece I did. It's a um, large work. It's I think 15 feet long and it's called the book of experience found and it's based on poems by William Blake. And um, this is the bookcase. And it, it's quite sort of kitsch. It's this very strange image of this sort of almost like a Playboy bunny. But I actually found this box of powder in Italy. And to me, it was so strange. It, Italians have some really amazing images on just everyday objects. And it's this little boy with powder pour, pouring it on this figure, this woman, this mother figure. And to me, you could like, I, you could have a field day. It's like, it's like Sigmund Freud, Oedipus Rex. It's just got all these really interesting associations. So I decided to do this work using a couple of William Blake's poems. And these are just some of the images. So, I mean, this is, oh, going back. I'll just go back to show you the whole piece when it's, so there's a series and they're all in a line, but in the end, you take the, 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 the drawings, they come out of that, that, that structure and then you can go into the case and the case is behind glass as well with the gold. 
And this is another work that I did around the same time dealing with childhood innocence. Um, this is a work on uh, an old map, a navigational map that I painted over just watercolor. Here's another more, um, you know, fantasy driven kind of uh, um, somewhat cartoony as, as is this one. And then I'm going to end, I don't know if I'm going too fast or too slow, but I'm going to end by showing some blueprint series. There's a whole series I've done. Um, this is a, a series I've done on blueprints that belong to a friend. His name was John Hilberry. He just recently passed away. And he did this series of blueprints in 1993 called Genesis. And they were for a building in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And he was to um, redesign the building so that it would serve three functions. It would serve as a synagogue, a church, and an entertainment center. So he had to have um, additions so that it would serve that. And a friend gave these, a stack of them to me, out of the blue one day. They were in the garbage along someone's, found them in someone's neighbor. And it was one of those Duchampian things. It's like, why am I getting these? They're like these ready-made objects that um, I needed to think about what I could do with them. So um, I decided I, to, to, to whitewash them and begin painting images over it. So here you can see where I've jostled the pages and you can still see the ghost images of the blueprint. And in this case, it's a, a gold placed over it. And then others I um, painted directly on it with, with oil. And then this is a series that go with the, 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 the two um, a monolith that I did, the hymns, hymn of the seraphim and hymn of the cherubim. And this is a series that, that relate to those works and it's called In My Father's House. And so this is a, a series of works in which I used the marks of the blue of the architect and then I omitted certain areas. And so this is, a, this is an external view of the, the structure you're about to enter into, and you can see the gold leaf doors. And then here you're inside. So these are the structures. And none of these forms I created, they're all in the blueprint itself. So I basically just highlighted what the architect had already done. And I um, painted out areas that I thought were extraneous or unnecessary. Here again, structure. And this is in the uh, interior rooms. You can see the outline of the exterior walls in gold. Here's the pyramid. And here's, this is really an homage to uh, artists who have passed away this past two years that I've known. And so cross represents each of the artists in the city. Here I show the monolith. I will read a poem that a friend wrote who um, is a writer. And she wrote about the uh, monoliths for my show at Wasserman. And I thought it would, was really beautiful. I thought I'd end with it. And again, like I said, this really was done to kind of honor those who have passed away, but also it's our own kind of loss in our lives or our own future. And so she wrote this poem called Reckoning. And it's, it's here, it's, um, here we see the truth of what we walk through in the water, in the dark mirror. We recognize how the years scored us, our bodies so vulnerable, so close to others, so intimate, so raw. We see the shadow standing behind us, reminding us of what we lost and what remains. Do we dare to look back to this life, to this hour, to this time in history, and claim that it is our own. And that's by Maureen Aiken. And I'll end just with, um, this is a work called Leading the Way to the Kingdom Eternal. And it's an old found frame again that I did this painting. This is quite a long time ago, 1989. But um, it's this little figure on a boat leading to another place. So. Anyway, that's my talk. Any questions?
Ema. Yeah, so the question was, um, in some of the construction works, there's a little reference possibly to Joseph Cornell, but also the altar in, you know, the assemblage works, like expand a little more on, like the meaning behind them. Yeah, or, I mean, I'm, I'm really curious about how, like, you were talking about the other world they meant, like, in the Yeah, it's, um, I guess part of my interest is, you know, making these, and, and yes, I, early in, in my career, I was watch, looking at a lot of Joseph Cornell. I really like structures that are almost like dioramas of, um, and when I was a child, I actually did make dioramas. I took shoe boxes and I would take and turn them into these little, scenes. And so I think it comes out of, again, that need to um, build structures and create some ground in reality, but then alter it to make it more fantasy. And it's always a struggle. You know, I, you know, it's hard to, um, you know, make something um, that's believable, but maybe that's not too real. And I'm always in between those two worlds. And sometimes I feel I don't always hit the mark, but I think part of my reason for going into structures where I like to build now more minimal things is that I, it's, it's, it's giving less for the viewer to look at and more for them to bring their own association into what it could mean. And so, um, I, I'm so critical. I look back at the work, like, I mean, of all the stuff I looked at, maybe there's like five works in there that I think are decent. <laughs> I think as an artist, you're just like always feeling like you're not quite there, but, and like I was telling Greg too, so much of art needs to be experienced firsthand. You have to be around it. And it's really a, a struggle too, to make art because so often we're, we're failing, you know, our, there's so many failures to just making a work and, um, but I've been blessed. I mean, of, of most of the work I do, I sell. You know, I make a living off of my art. That's how I've done my whole life. So things have um, always find a way of like attracting people to it or to an institution, and and then they get to deal with it. <laughs> so. Yes. Is it a large bold black pieces? Are they right across from each other? So they reflect. Well, so she was asking whether the large um, monoliths are close to each other. And it depends on where they're shown. When it was at the gallery in Was at Wasserman Projects, the gallery is quite large and they were quite far apart. So there wasn't a relationship with them. And if you could see in the studio, they were closer together. And what I've said is wherever they end up, it's really up to, I think of this piece as a collaboration. Wherever they end up, if, if they go to a museum or institution, it, I, I think of the institution, like I think of this is like, this is um, Belinda and Rahima's home and I'm in their home. They decide where things go. And so like if a museum were to take these and they had a space for it, it's up to them to decide how they relate to each other. So there's a collaborative element, like, but I think they work best when they are close so that you can see them reflecting in one another because the goal right now, they're, they're only probably like three feet apart so that when you stand in front of the black, you see a reflection, but then you can also see the gold reflecting in the black and the black and the gold. And to me, that's really what's yeah, beautiful. Yeah. And then I've, oft, I've been thinking more recently, like, so the shape they're, they're, and again, I don't have a figure to show you the relationship, how big they are, but they're nine feet high by five feet. 
in what I really ideally see is that I'd love to have a room built where the doors that you enter into are the exact shape of the monolith and the exact size, like five by nine. So you enter one door, five by nine, and there's an exit, same thing. And then inside would be the monoliths. So it's almost like the monoliths, if they were to be re, re, put up to the door, they would seal it. So you would be like in, like like the Egyptians, you'd be in a tomb and you'd be locked in. And to me, that would be beautiful. So um, maybe one day uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make that happen. <laughs> so, because I think a lot of like what I do too, even like this work, it's like, it's really all about like the word that comes to mind when I think about my work, if I had to put one word, it's elegy. It's a song or a lamentation uh, for the dead. And I really um, don't mean it in a macabre way, but uh, I think it comes from my Latin roots, but I think art uh, for me, I do it as a um, remembrance. And uh, as you saw, there's a lot of references to family in some of the work but also our family of mankind, you know, that um, my work is really um, an elegy to us all. And, you know, it's um, no different than how Egyptians would wrap bodies and put them in, you know, gold sarcophagus and pray for the souls of the, the dead. I think I do the same in my work, or I'd like to try to think of it as that. Yes. To what extent have I been immersed mm -hmm. in Latin culture? Like how, how knowledgeable or? No, I, I mean, you, yeah, like yeah, yeah, so, yeah, no, no. Well, my grandparents were on my father's side were Catholic. My father was the 11th of 12th child. He was 11th born of 12. My mother was um, the eighth born and they eloped because at the time, you know, Protestant and Catholic, you weren't supposed to marry, you know, so they um, eloped and um, we weren't really brought up, you know, under any Orthodox, you know, faith, but I, you know, my mother did become a Lutheran and so we did, you know, so, but as far as the traditions and the Latin cultures, you know, the day of the day, I looked at my grandparents, I learned so much from my grandparents growing up, going to the farm and just how I learned um, from my grandmother. And I've been writing a lot about my memories as a child. And, um, you know, my grandmother was a beautiful woman who um, had a rose garden, but she was the hardest working woman I have ever met. And so I feel like um, I, I, I've learned through, in their struggle, they're coming to this country. And actually there was a film, before my father died, he went to Moralia, where my grandparents are from. And he, along with my cousin, made a film about their migration. And just recently it was revised and it was shown at the Detroit Institute of Arts a year ago about my grandparents, which was just phenomenal about their story. And, um, it's on audio tape. When I was young, I interviewed my grandparents and they tell the story of how they crossed the Rio Grande and they didn't know what they were going to do. And they uh, were hired by a farmer and uh, had two children and eventually came to the north. And when he was 60 years old, he finally got an acre of land and he retired when he was in his 70s. And he, he you know, was a dairy farmer. And so I, I don't, in the tradition of like Day of the Dead, celebrate, but I feel like every day I'm celebrating the heritage of my, my, my family. So Emily City and Brown City, which is uh, about a, it's, it's near the, the uh, port, above Port Huron, near the thumb. Uh, what's that? Oh, oh, there you go. And I was born in Emily City. My parents are buried in Emory City. Yeah. Well, thank you.